Hello and welcome to a frayed, rather belated session of David Starkey Talks and the members' question and answer. Uh, the question that I want to tackle today comes from uh, one of my American members from Austin Pomper in Lansdale, Pennsylvania. And he goes as follows, and it's very much an Anglo-American debate. And I think it's an important one, and it raises big general questions. It also enables a little bit of intonation teasing to take place, which I always enjoy. Uh, but it's the, the, the really big questions that are not simply about politics, but go into the heart of how does a people function? What is a people? What is the place of tradition? So it goes as follows. Uh, dear Dr. Starkey, why is the unwritten, that's between Ray's commas, unwritten constitution of Britain seen as such a benefit by the British people and the British government? Uh, of course, being unwritten, there is an inherent flexibility in the process of British government and constitutionalism. But surely that will be more of a flaw than an actual benefit because it allows any part of the government to supplant the authority and sovereignty of the others if they have enough power or support to do so. Would not, Austin continues drawing a conclusion, Britain be better served governmentally if the prerogatives, the legal authorities and the boundaries of each institution or constituent estate of government were set down in writing might, he then speculates, the civil wars of the 17th century between the royalists and parliamentarians have had a different outcome or been fought on different battle lines altogether if a written constitution had existed during that time. Well, Austin, this is fascinating, isn't it? Because clearly you represent, and in, in the back of your mind, and judging by the language you use, you may well be a lawyer, um, possibly, in fact, quite likely, I'd have thought, studied history um, at school, at university, uh, and it certainly, of course, would have been inculcated in your high school uh, with the civics classes that represent that great moment of the creation of the American Republic as a central episode in human history. And central to that episode is the creation of the American Constitution, that trio, we can even call it a trinity, it tends to be treated with that degree of seriousness of the Declaration of Independence, uh, of the Constitution itself, and of the Bill of Rights. And these, these documents are seen, again, continuing the religious language, as well as a trinity, they are the Ark of the Covenant, of America. They're what makes America unique and special and the reason for the success of America, uh, and it is a very considerable success, is these documents. And of course, going with that as the, the texts themselves uh, are, are given, well, they are treated like the Ark of the Covenant. If you go into the archives in Washington, you actually see them there in this great pillared hall placed upon an altar with guards and flags and all the rest of it around them. They are, they are the equivalent of sacred texts, and they're treated as sacred texts. And of course, uh, the men who compose them, uh, the men who write them, the founding fathers are treated, uh, look at that phrase, the founding fathers, that they are the... The, the, the fathers were, of course, the fathers of the church. The, again, the religious analogies, the founding saints of, of Christianity. These are the secular saints of this new human political miracle, which is the creation of America. Um, so you've, and, they, and they are venerated and, and, and uh, vast claims are made for them. I think in many ways, very fairly. The debates, um, uh, the debates in the Constitutional Convention are remarkable. Those debates in, in Philadelphia, in which the principles of government are addressed, and again, I mean, that that that's that's element of debating society about it. And um, and then, of course, as the principles of the Constitution, its practicalities and the reasons for adopting it, um, are are uh, dealt with on a much broader canvas. I mean, after the, the convention has agreed to it, it has to be ratified by all the states. And that requires a process of public consultation. And to do that, primarily in New York, you get 
you get the, the, the great newspaper war of the Federalist with those extraordinary essays and by Madison, by Hamilton, and so on, and explaining, expounding the principles of, of, the, uh, of, of the Declaration, the principles uh, of the Constitution, justifying them, arguing for different interpretations of them, setting them against broad patterns of political history, political theory, analysis, and so on. Very, very, it's a very remarkable process, and I don't want to uh, denigrate it, and I don't want to diminish it too much, but I do want to argue that I think we've got it wrong. I want to argue even, and really, Austin, and you're never going to watch me again, I want to argue that this great Central American myth, the myth, of course, which is embodied in one of the greatest speeches ever uttered, uh, in other words, the Gettysburg Address, the, the great address of Abraham Lincoln uh, delivered on the, the battlefield at Gettysburg uh, when, when the cemetery there is dedicated uh, only a few months after the battle to those who'd fallen in that great crucial battle of the American Civil War. Uh, the Gettysburg speech is the one that enunciates most clearly, isn't it, the nature uh, of that myth. The, it's worth reading. Um, let me just sketch it now. Um, so this is Lincoln shaping the myth of America. Four score and seven years ago, that's 1776, the Declaration, the writing of the Declaration by Jefferson. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all men are created equal. Again, just read it again. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers, again that phrase, brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived, new conceived new birth, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And then the speech ends with the, the, the reprise, the call, that we're not just here to commemorate the dead who have fought for this cause, we are here to rededicate ourselves to a, a new moment, a new moment of rebirth. And, uh, and it's the last sentence that we are here to receive that these to, uh, that we are here highly to resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that the government of the people by the people for the people shall not perish from the earth. Earth. So that's the great myth of America, and the myth, of course, founded on the preamble to the Declaration of Independence written by Jefferson, famous, those famous words, actually not much noticed at the time, but coming to acquire enormous meaning and significance afterwards. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that amongst those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted amongst men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government. So is that what America really is about? Is that why it works? Is it these extraordinary ideas, grandiose ideas, embodied in wonderful prose and in the institutions and the texts of the Declaration of the Constitution of the Bill of Rights that are the key to America? See, I don't, I'm really going to commit heresy now, Austin. I don't think it is. I think why America is successful is that the American people, the colonialists in America, and the the thirteen the inhabitants of the thirteen colonies, didn't become by as you know, were taught there by some miracle of rebirth. They didn't become free men as a result of the of the revolution and, and all of these documents. And there wasn't, I mean, again, really picking up the actual phrase, uh, the, 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 uh, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. I don't think there was that creative miracle. I don't think there was that great rebirth. The key to understanding America is simply 
very simple, that Americans were already free. They already had the rights and a freeborn Englishman and, and Britons, if you want to call it that, because of course there were many other kind of English descent there, but they were they were within the tradition of English self-government and English law. All the colonies already had representative assemblies. All the colonies um, had uh, English law. They all operated according to the principles of English law. In other words, the important thing about America is that there is already a long and deep root and inherited tradition of political freedom, political self-government, and those patterns of assumption, behavior, responsibility, and all the rest of it that go with it. The idea you know, that you have a representative assembly, that there are political parties, that, 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 there, are, that there is due process of law, the, the, the notion of trial by a jury, all of these things, they weren't, they weren't invented. None of them was invented in 1776 or 1787 or 1789, 91 with the Bill of Rights. All of these things were inherited. They were written down. They were given novel glosses. They were put into different languages. But what you're dealing with is a pattern of inheritance and tradition. And it's really important that we drive this point home. I must say, I've always made this point, I mean, teasingly, when talking to my American friends, you know, I used to have a house in America uh, until indeed last year, and I've been, I've never taught there full time, but I've had involvement in American institutions. I had what I always used to call my deck chair of history because I only held it for the summer quarter for a few summers at Dartmouth College and so on and so on. And I always used to tease, my, still do, tease my American friends um, that the, uh, the, you know, the, the grandiosities of the American Constitution is just really 18th century England in fancy dress. You know? that the, the, uh, the, the, um, the president is really just George III without his wig, except, of course, <laughs> with Trump and Reagan, you, you had doubts about that. The, 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 uh, if you actually look at the two houses, the, the distribution of power between them is, or despite the fact one's called the Senate, and you, you drape it in Roman dress, and the other um, uh, is, 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 is called the House of Representatives, they're really the House of Common, the House of commons and and the, and a version of the house of lords and um, the the balance of power between the two houses is pretty much what it was um, in the 18th century i mean even to the specificities of odd names i mean why is the presiding officer of the uh, house of representatives called speaker well because the presiding office of the House of Commons was and had been called for several hundred years the Speaker. Why, more amusingly, and this is a, this is the teasing. This is the teasing point. Uh, do you have um, to uh, as as the administrative officer, not the presiding officer, but the administrative officer of the House of Representatives? Why do you have this person that you're not really terribly sure how to pronounce his name or what indeed he's supposed to do? The, the sergeant at arms, the sergeant. At arms in English because of course there was a sergeant in arms in England and originally assigned by the king to the House of Commons and bearing the mace that's what sergeants at arms did there was they, they were they were former soldier uh, sergeant was a particular rank and the, the the sergeants at arms bore the mace and the mace becomes the symbol um, of of the the English House of Commons and so on so you see what I mean that that what you've really got in the American Constitution is the lightest form of top dressing, of reworking, of systematizing what already existed in England, what these people were used to, what they understood, which is why the whole thing works as though it does. Of course, it had to be adapted uh, in one very fundamental way, and that, that fundamental way was to a federal constitution because of the already the scale of America, the fact that you had 13 separate states and so on, and the, 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 the great contribution, and I think it is the great contribution, uh, of the Constitution is the, the introduction of a federalism which did not exist uh, in the English Constitution, the British Constitution, certainly the English Constitution, and to which I'm afraid the whole Constitution of the British Isles, with one single overwhelming unit, 
England and other much smaller units, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and so on. And it doesn't lend itself at all easily to a federal structure in the same way America was, you know, blessed with that multiplicity of 13 that's grown into 50. And, and on that scale, you can handle federalism even when you have one or two states which are overwhelmingly big uh, in terms of population size and others that are very small. It, it, sort, of, it sort of pans out. So, what I'm, so the, the point is, it's always been clear to me that, it, that, the, that, that the great American adventure was nothing like as novel as it pretended to be. And that in many ways, what happens in constitutional convention, as I said, is a process of dressing up what they were already familiar with in, in a certain number of new clothes. What is different about the way I've approached it now, well, A, it's much less jokey, there's much less emphasis on the surgeon at arms, but it's also the emphasis on the idea of tradition. And this is something that I've become powerfully aware of. Um, again, you know, uh, my age, you begin to look backwards, and uh, I, I've been looking backwards uh, because I'm in the middle of my autobiography. I've been looking backwards at the years that that I spent, misspent very often, if I'm truthful, uh, uh, at the London School of Economics, where I was from uh, 1972 to the mid-1990s, and some of the extraordinary colleagues that I had there, um, one of whom sticks very much in my mind, Ken Minogue, the, the sort of Australian-British, very much still Australian, uh, British academic conservative thinker, um, whom, I mean, I knew was a wonderful, jokey, reverent, what marvellous company. I got to know him really well when we did a review, uh, so, you know, sort of jokey summary of the school's history uh, for its centenary year uh, in 1995, the school being founded in 1895. Um, and Ken, Ken was marvellous at that sort of thing witty and funny and came up with marvelous stories and 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 uh, and 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 recollections and whatever i hadn't really registered just how serious and original a political thinker he was uh, i'd been reading what is his earliest and i think his great the greatest work or uh, the liberal mind called the liberal mind written at the very beginning of the 1960s which i think is pretty much a clue to everything it's astonishingly prescient. It's a clue to everything that's gone wrong uh, with our culture, uh, in particular in the Anglo-Saxon world that we're talking about now. And it's he who makes this point about America. The reason for the success of the American Revolution is the fact that the traditions and the habits of proper free politics and the... You know, the to maintain a free politics requires an extraordinary subtle forms of behavior. You have to have particular attitudes towards each other. You have to have attitudes to law. You have to have abilities finally to compromise, to defer, and all that sort of thing. These are entrenched and rather peculiar habits. And it's a very striking comparison, of course. If you, if, if Austin, you look at the other great revolution that's actually taking place at the exact moment that the American Constitution is being formulated in, the, uh, in Philadelphia, which is the French Revolution. The French Revolution enunciates identical principles. It, too, comes up with a marvelously elaborate constitution. It, too, comes up with declaration of the rights of man and the citizen, which is very much modeled, uh, uh, or takes, takes, I think, its inspiration from the Bill of Rights. And it is, of course, a catastrophic failure. It is a failure for the very simple reason that the French were not a free people. They were not used to the practices of national politics in the same way that the English or the, their, their offshoots in America were, that the French Ancien Regime uh, had in, its, in, in, in the earlier days, in the High Middle Ages, it had very developed representative institutions, but they wither and die. This is again, uh, when I've done my videos on Parliament, this is the point that I make. The peculiarity about the English Parliament, that parliamentary tradition that feeds into uh, the American constitutional tradition, and I'm arguing now, provides its essential bedrock. It's not 
unique to England at all. The thing that's unique to England is not that England had a parliament, but the English parliament survived and thrived virtually everywhere else in Europe. Parliaments came to be seen simply in the in the 17th and the 18th century. They simply became came to be seen as a nuisance. They got in the way of efficient government and they either withered on the vine or they were formally abolished. So the French go into their revolution with no tradition of national representative government at all, with no tradition of, of politics that operate other than on, finally, a command model. And this is why France, of course, the country that sees itself as pioneering modern politics, has never established a stable political system, a stable constitutional system. Look at France. The American Constitution um, of, of 1789 is still in force with, with amendments, with 20 odd or whatever it is, amendments. But the, the core of it is still there. France, well, it has had two monarchies, it has had five republics, and it has had two empires. So you've had nine entirely different constitutional settlements in the 200 and odd years um, since the French Revolution. In other words, a constitution in itself, the document in itself, very often is not, sorry, also this really is true, it is not worth the piece of paper that it is written on. If you look around the world, the average length of time which a paper constitution survives is less than a decade. Now, this should force us to rethink very substantially. So you think, again, Austin, I've got a real problem with 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 um with what happened in America. What it what the the deification as I said, the treating of all of these documents as the Ark of the Covenant has done. What it's led people to do on a worldwide basis is A, to think, aren't constitutions wonderful? The first thing we need to do is write one. But also to think that words have a, a, a degree of, of almost magical significance. I mean, if you look at both the League of Nations and you look at the United Nations, the, the method of setting them up is very, very analogous to the processes of of the ele the alleged creation of America, you, know, you you have you you create a machinery, you have founding charters, you have enunciations of bills of rights and all the rest of it, and what do you finish up with? You finish up with the immediate impotence of the League of Nations against the dictators, and I'm afraid the impotence, the equal impotence of the United Nations against Putin and the invasion of the Ukraine. Because, of course, there is no body of behavior that sustains those high ideals. And it's perfectly clear that the only people who've ever really practiced the the ideals of the United Nations are, well, this is something else. They are the Anglosphere, the countries that, like America, but at different stages, fanned out from the British Empire. Be, and this this point is perfectly this this point is 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 perfectly clear. American statesmen make it absolutely explicitly uh, in the 1940s and the 1950s and the 1960s to say that the the foundation documents of the United Nations essentially embody Western values. That's what they are. In other words, they are embedded in a particular tradition. Now, this raises, Austin, another question, doesn't it? Which is, America presents itself as being unique. All those myths about, you know, a, a new nation conceived in liberty and all the rest of it. But actually, when you look at it, America looks, in so many ways, very much like Canada, very much like. Australia, obviously on a completely different scale uh, from, from, from New Zealand. But those countries too, of course, are what? They're former British colonies, like America, that become independent, though without civil war and with the, the blessing, the, the 
positively benign blessing of the British government, which had learned its lessons from the disaster uh, of, of the War of Independence with America, they become independent with constitutions which are rather similar to America, but much more similar uh, to that of Britain, because, again, they are free people used to doing things in the British or the English or whatever you want to call it. Way, which is which is there is a constitu there is a Canadian constitution, um, though it it is it is it was it's an act of Parliament of the British Parliament, which it, which is repatriated. But essentially, it creates um, a, a, a parliamentary system which is recognisably similar uh, to that of Britain, um, but with again the element of federation, which is also very important in Australia and New Zealand itself has got an an actual unwritten constitution again, like Britain, directly derived. So this elevation of, of the idea of constitution as some sort of, of magic document is the American foundation myth. And I see why it's important and I understand its importance. But I think the idea which separates it from political tradition is profoundly, desperately dangerous. And of course, the dangers, and this is a separate point, but it's, it's worth making now, the dangers are exacerbated by Jefferson's opening, which suggests, and this is the great problem, that these rights that that he talks about, um, the, the, the right of life, liberty, and happiness, are common to all human beings. They are the rights of, the God-given rights of all human beings. In other words, that they are universal. They're part of being human. They're not part of a specific historical tradition. It's This is why, of course, you get the neocons, this is why you get liberal interventionism, this is why you get the notion that America will be welcomed by op with open arms by the Iraqis, why it's worth, or indeed the Afghans, and you know, why it's worth fighting a war in Afghan for the right of Afghan women, not only to have education, but to wear miniskirts. You know, this, this absurd idea of, of the fact that we're all the same, when it's perfectly clear we're all different, and this, this, you know, I'm a conservative. And the essential point about conservatism is the recognition of human difference. The central point of liberalism is the belief, the false belief of human similarity, that we're all the same. And the, 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 the foundation myth of America has given a terrible impetus to that false narrative, that false story. Of liberalism, but let's come back now to 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 some of the other issues that are raised by this. Um, if you remember at your last paragraph, Austin, you say, "Might the civil wars of the 17th century between royalists and parliamentarians have had a different outcome, or been fought on ba different battle lines altogether, if a written constitution had existed?" Well, can I gently remind you that having a written constitution did not spare America from its hugely terrible, actually infinitely more civil war was bad enough. But the American Civil War, the Civil War of 1861 to 1865, which of course produces the Gettysburg speech with the great embodiment of the myth, the founding myth of America, the American Civil War is the first industrial war. It is a monstrous war with vast casualties, with huge armies of badly trained troops in in uh, fighting uh, with 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 the, the new machinery the new weapons which are created by industrialization um, it's a monstrous struggle and it was not prevented by your constitution what is again striking is looking indeed let's just go to the civil war uh, in england the war that that led to the execution of Charles the First in in 1649, uh, the um, and the emergence of a military dictatorship under Oliver Cromwell, and the creation of what's known as the Protectorate um, before the Restoration of 1660. And what is I think striking about that period? You abolish monarchy. Uh, in 1649, and the English abolished monarchy at least as thoroughly as the French. You know, the name of king is de is 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 declared to be an abomination because we hadn't um, in the 17th century uh, developed the same degree of historical sensitivity. The French in 1789, despite despite the in, uh, 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 
ensuring, ensuring years, the, the year of the king's execution, uh, despite the um, the uh, you know, the monstrous savagery, uh, the, the the guillotine of uh, the deliberate humiliation uh, of Louis as a, uh, uh, um, of, of Louis the Sixteenth, as opposed to the very formal uh, respect, even on the scaffold. And that is actually paid to Charles I and the giving him of, of a deliberately dignified death. The, 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 the French in the 18th century have an awareness of history. So whereas the modern crown jewels in France are all destroyed and melted down and the, the jewels themselves sold off, the historic things like the Main de Justice, the, the crown of Charlemagne and all of that sort of stuff, the, uh, they are kept, they are preserved. Uh, whereas in England, uh, in the uh, uh, following the execution of the king in 1649, the lot goes. The the regalia which went back to Edward, the confessor, the crown of 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 Alfred the Great, the, the great Tudor imperial crown. Everything goes, and what you have in the in in the tower nowadays are recreations uh, after the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, going right through to many of the most beautiful crowns are the earlier 20th century crowns um, created. In the, the, the two, I think, most beautiful are the ones that are actually created for the Delhi Durbar uh, at the beginning of the reign of George V for his coronation and uh, uh, his inauguration, if you like, uh, as Emperor of India. The, uh, but the, 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 stagger, the staggering destructiveness um, of 1649 in England, the, 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 the attempt at the obliteration of the word of king from the language. But you know what happens from that point, Austin? There's a quest to somehow get back to the political tradition. The problem is that you have Cromwell, uh, who embodies military rule. He also embodies a notion of the right of the saints, that's to say the politically elect, those, uh, those self-selected people who are justified in the sight of God to impose their wishes on a recalcitrant and sinful nation. He embodies all of that. But the, the, whole, the, whole, the whole feeling of the period uh, from, 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 from his ascent to power, the dissolution of the rump parliament and so on, is this desperate sense we want to get back to the politics that we know. And you see that the, this period, of course, is one of extraordinary experimentation. Uh, you begin uh, with, with the formal institution of Cromwell as Lord Protector. By the way, you can also already see this is a, a nudging backwards because the title of Lord Protector was, in fact, the normal title for the regent in medieval England. That's the title that Richard III has in, in those, those, those brief weeks when he claims to be ruling on behalf of his nephew, uh, Edward V, and so on. The, the title of Lord Protector just means regent. So there's already, in a sense, that you, you're more than halfway to the restoration of a monarchy when you simply give the title of, of, of Protector. But the, the first formal written constitution is the, the, the instrument of government of 1653, which, which leaves in place the structures of military rule and of, of the major generals in the counties, of an extraordinarily powerful um, a, a council of state. And, and you have a, a, a forms of a nominate, effectively a nominated parliament and, and profound disputes, immediate disputes uh, between the protector and, and the parliament as to the distribution of powers in very much the same way that there have been disputes between parliament uh, and Charles I. And the, by the time you've got to 1657, um, when, when the, the, there's a sense that really England feels it cannot continue without the forms of monarchy, without the things that without the traditions that people are used to. And there is the humble petition and advice, 1657, in which Cromwell is actually offered the crown. Um, and you go back to a constitution which comes within whiskers of the old way you were governed. Uh, Cromwell feels the pressures of the army, the pressures of republicanism, prevent him from accepting the crown. And anyway, he, um, he dies shortly afterwards. And from that point onwards, it really becomes a race as to who will become king again. Will it be Richard Cromwell, Cromwell's son? Will it be uh, the Prince of Wales? Will it, will it be the man who becomes Charles II with the restoration? In other words, 
England shows itself in that period of the 1650s rather like a Russian doll. There's this, this constant sense that it wants to get upright, it wants to go back to its traditions, and that the, 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 the formal written documents and the constitutions, in some ways, they, they are getting, they're simply getting in the way. The problem, of course, is that the political and military realities um, required because of Cromwell's position, uh, being rooted in the army, the power of the army, the, 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 the specific ideological composition, the specific religious uh, composition of the thing, all of those fought against the traditional distributions of power in England. But finally, the solution that's adopted, it's very simple, isn't it? We revert back. And this is something I think quite remarkable. The English Revolution has to be the only revolution, and again, I'd love it if people come back and give me really good examples of, of, of what I'm going to say now is wrong. The English Revolution has to be the only one that is comprehensively reversed, that you can stop a revolution, that, uh, that, that, that the, you know, there were many of the elements of, the many of the possibilities of social revolution in the England of the 1650s, but the, the overall balance of society, the overall uh, weight, again, the weight of tradition, the way things were done, finally, you go back. Why? Because you want legitimacy. You want, politics depends finally, not on written documents, but it depends on the sense that this is the right way to do things. You don't want all the time having to be wave a gun at somebody or wave a writ at them or whatever. You want them to obey and do or, or to participate because it's inside them, not because it's enforced on them from outside. And those are about traditions and practices of behavior which are deeply entrenched and deeply rooted. So what happens in England in the 17th century is this, this reassertion of tradition, a tradition of course which presents its own problems from 1660 to, uh, 16, um, to, 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 six, to 1688, 1689 to the Glorious Revolution and it's a tradition which is adapted and moulded and shaped by circumstance, but the, the 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 desperate concern of everybody in 1660, again in 1688-89, is to preserve at the you know at the expense of reality and um, uh, the myth the myth of continuity, the myth particularly of royal continuity, with the great myth of course that James II, the king who is dethroned and um, uh, uh, forcibly dethroned uh, by an invasion uh, by his son-in-law. Uh, by, by William III uh, and, and James's daughter Mary, um, who were the rulers of the Netherlands. Um, the, 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 the myth is that James had voluntarily abdicated the crown, so there isn't this rupture uh, of, of, of the royal succession. The, the, the idea of legitimacy remains. And this seems to me to be central to the English experience, which is the core of tradition and the core of the monarchy in maintaining that, the only continuous institution, um, with the possible exception of the English church, running across English and, and latterly uh, British history. So the, the, the pattern then, it seems to me, is very, very strongly we need to diminish the role of written documents when we talk about the, the functionings of politics. We need to have a much higher regard to the unspoken traditions of political behaviour. And what is very clear, it seems to me, is that this is true everywhere. I mean, look, 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 Austin now in America. The, 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 the fact that, that, that suddenly the whole question of abortion rights has come up because the Supreme Court um, has had a, has had a second think. And um, because it, it is the great problem again with with written constitutions and when you em when you embody a, 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 a very high uh, role for courts and uh, that you you get attention to you not between what can be creative legalism the the roe versus wade judgment and 
democratic consent and it is clear that in america uh, this is this is a fest this is a festering issue it was dealt with in, in england in britain in a completely different way it was dealt with and um, it was dealt with by a, a campaign it was dealt with legislatively and it was dealt with without vast general declarations of principle See, this is another problem that you get yourself into with written constitutions that have grandiose phrases. You argue about principles. Now, I learned at a very early age to be very dubious about the word principle. It was one of my mother's favorite words, and I decided, being a precocious child, that what a principle meant was something that you felt about so strongly that you wouldn't listen to reason on the subject. And as we can see from what's going on in America now, it, the, enunciating things in terms of principle naturally leads to polarization. I mean, is there a right to, to abortion? Is there not a right? To abortion. It leads to this very, very hard line, this leads to this polarization. Whereas a debate, which is the was the English one, which is, well, actually, there is a law against infanticide and and and, and abortion, but but how can we modify that law with regard to you know, the safety of the woman, the 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 the, 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 the rights or whatever you want and rights. You see, I've slipped into the language. Uh, the, the, the the decent point at which which or or the, rather the point at which um, the fetus is so far developed uh, that, that it really does look like in, infanticide to abort it. And you, know, you get this debate about the number of weeks and so on uh, 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 with, within which um, a, a pregnancy can be terminated and so on. And it becomes a matter of ways and means rather than this gigantic polarization which results from rights and debating these things as, as matters of legal principle rather than matters of practical politics. And this again seems to me to be one of the central and, and wholly welcome inheritances of the English political tradition, and that unwritten tradition that we were talking about. And you can see, and I will finish on, on the point that I'm going to make now, though we, we could be talking t talking about it endlessly. You can see the, the, the tampering of the English constitution, the British constitution, in the 1990s and early 2000s uh, by the Blair government have had, in fact, disastrous consequences. Because what the Blair government did was to think that because the English constitution is a very peculiar document that it doesn't correspond at all to the various fictions of the 18th century, it was somehow a bad thing. The most obvious point about the English constitution is that it doesn't have any form or virtually no form of separation of powers. Now, there's a real paradox here, because, of course, the, uh, the doctrine of separation of powers is formulated by Montesquieu, uh, the Frenchman living in England in the middle of the 18th century and incorporating the idea into his spirit of the laws, and it's allegedly based um, on the functionings of, of the English constitution. Well, there's a I've written about this in one of my critic articles. It's very striking. Montesquieu barely speaks English. Uh, he spends his time whilst he's in England in aristocratic French-speaking circles, and he gets his understanding of English politics not actually from observing them at all seriously. He gets them from a particular pamphleteer, a man called Bolingbroke, um, uh, and uh, Bolingbroke's um, uh, uh, essay uh, on the idea of a patriot king, which floats so many of the ideas that actually do go into the American Constitution, the ideas of separation of powers, of fixed-term parliaments, um, and all that sort of thing. And the and a, a moment's reflection, for example, shows that the is no separation of powers in England and that there can't be a separation of powers in England because Austin, I don't know whether you, I think you probably do realise this, the uh, the English Prime Minister, uh, who is the executive, he embodies for the time being the executive powers of the monarch, he actually exercises those powers by advising the monarch, of course. The Prime Minister is created Prime Minister because he commands a majority in the key house of the legislature, because he commands a majority uh, in the House of Commons. In other words, the executive is actually in the legislative. Um, the 
for the simple reason, of course, that the English Parliament was in fact the crown in Parliament. It was the crown uh, sitting, uh, uh, literally, the, the monarch sat in the House of Lords um, with, with the, with the uh, advice and assistance in that phrase of the key elements in the realm, the Lords Temporal, the, uh, that's to say the great barons and the great nobles, the Lords Spiritual, the bishops there because they too are great landowners, and the representatives of the towns and county communities uh, in the House of Commons. And the whole body determined all forms of political activity um, uh, and it had it had a sovereign it had a sovereignty over the law the, the the idea that we have of parliamentary sovereignty now that didn't in any way stop the development of a profoundly independent tradition of english law uh, the, the, the the legal system of england is the only one that bears comparison to the wonderfully elaborate structures of roman law to a tradition again in england of uh, uh, the embodiment of the independence of the the legal system in institutions, the inns of court in London, which are really the law schools uh, in London, uh, uh, which which are also societies of lawyers, which which continue uh, from from the middle Middle Ages right through to the present, and so on, and the extraordinarily powerful tradition, uh, which is is reflected in things like dress and so on, that that with with recognisable continuities uh, going across centuries, but nevertheless, the there is no the the is is no separation of powers. Uh, the, uh, the principal legal officer of the crown, the Lord Chancellor, was also the presiding officer uh, of the uh, of of the House of Lords of the Upper House of Parliament, um, and again uh, was a member of the cabinet. Um, and Blair finds all of these things um, uncomfortable. Um, and you get the uh, you 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 get um, the uh, removal of the uh, it, it, the intention was actually to destroy the office of Lord Chancellor, but it appeared in so many statutes they couldn't actually get round to doing it. And instead, um, you create you know, a modern, very modern European thing, a sort of Secretary of State for Justice and and Lord Chancellor. You so you lift the Lord Chancellor out of the house of lords uh, you li you lift them uh, you you um, you deep both depoliticize and delegalize the post and um, you also um, uh, create a, a supreme court on the model of america uh, whereas in traditionally the house of lords itself in a special committee of judges was the the english appellate court so you lift that out so you you see what you're doing they're trying they're trying to do a kind of quasi separation of powers and it is completely disastrous why? Because it runs against tradition. Constitutions, if they work, have to be in accordance with the habits and traditions of a people. Tampering with them is disastrous. And the most extreme example of the tampering was actually carried out not by Blair, but by a kind of successor government, which was the Conservative Liberal Coalition which emerged under David Cameron uh, in 2010, and that introduced again very much on the American model, uh, and indeed some of the campaigners of the 18th century fixed term parliaments. And what that led to, of course, was the zombie parliament of uh, uh, 2017 to 2019, when Theresa May uh, virtually lost her majority and completely lost her majority uh, because a large section uh, of of the conservative uh, uh, backbenchers indeed several front benches uh, effectively cooperated with um, both the, both the liberals at uh, that point in opposition uh, and 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 the labor party to deny uh, a delay and 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 attempt to reverse the uh, the result of the referendum, uh, uh, for, for, uh, the result of the Brexit referendum, um, and the uh, and again aided by the role of the speaker by John Burko, reenacting very much the behaviour of the Long Parliament um, at the beginning of the America, uh, the beginning of the English Civil War, uh, in 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 resisting uh, the government uh, and treating it very much as though it were kind of alien force and. 
the zombie parliament was only broken by Boris Johnson. And at the same time, the Supreme Court started to enact quasi-American practices like declaring that the uh, suspension of parliament, the temporary suspension of parliament in prorogation was somehow unconstitutional, when of course it was just part of the managing of parliament. Because just going back to this to, 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 to the to the key point that I mentioned the peculiarity of the English Parliament, the longevity of the English Parliament, is because it survived. It survived because it was useful, that it was not simply a block on government. It becomes the basis of government. It becomes, this, this miracle is finally accomplished by the office of Prime Minister, and it's the peculiar double face of the Prime Minister, who of course is, is the, as it were, the, the controlling force on the monarchy and in, 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 from 1720, uh, when the office appears, the office of prime minister appears, it's the guarantee that the, the monarch will follow the broad wishes of parliament. But at the same time, the, the, the fact that the prime minister controls the patronage of the crown enables him to manage uh, the parliamentary assembly. So it's this Janus face of the thing which keeps the whole thing going and continues to manage parliament. And as you're seeing in America, the Representative assemblies need management. They need direction. And without it, you simply get stasis. You get a government that, 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 that breaks down. It's exactly as happened with the fixed-term parliament in act in England uh, between 2017 and 2019. You had a zombie period of politics in which nothing could happen because there was deadlock, because we'd broken the unwritten constitution, because we'd broken with tradition, because we'd thought we could substitute a few simple words for the profound lessons that we've learned. And this seems to me to be something that is desperately important. The ease with which we just change, the notion that we can just wave magic wands. Yes, sometimes you need to. There is a profound wisdom in the way things are. I know it runs against so much of what people feel. But look at the mess we're increasingly getting into. We need a reappraisal of the importance of tradition. We need to diminish the notion, I'm afraid, of those wonderful, magic, miracle moments in which countries are reborn and conceived in liberty. It sounds great. The practice is often horrible. Hello, and thank you for watching David Starkey Talks. If, as I very much hope, you're enjoying them, why not become more actively involved and join my Members Club? As a member, you'll be able to take part in the members-only weekly question and answer session suggest topics for forthcoming videos and have priority booking for my forthcoming live events. And while you're at it, why not have a look at the store page on my website davidstarkey.com. There you can purchase t-shirts and other merchandise, buy signed copies of my books and, if you're feeling brave and a bit flush, even arrange to take me out to lunch. Thank you once again for watching. I look forward to hearing from you and to welcoming you to my Members Club.